Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion on innovations in brewing. My name is Lauren Tijambri. I'm the Assistant Dean of College Relations and Development here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's talk. Today's panel discussion is part of Berkeley Ecosystems, a new initiative where you can learn, explore, and connect with Berkeley faculty, alumni, students, and industry experts on relevant topics. In April, we'll be hosting two talks, the first with Professor Omar Yagi on water harvesting from air anytime, anywhere, and the second with Professor Jeff Reimer on our changing atmosphere. Both of these topics will be incredibly fascinating and we uh, invite you to register using the link in the chat or later at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. Now for a few logistical matters regarding today's discussion. Today's panel discussion will be recorded as has all past events. Uh, in the coming days, you can go to ecosystems.berkeley.edu to access and share a recording of today's uh, talk. And you can also access past talks that are there as well. We are planning to field questions today towards the end of our discussion. So please use the Q&A functionality, not the chat function to share any thoughts or pose any questions with our panelists. We'll try to make sure to get to as many questions as possible uh, towards the end of our session. And finally, directly following uh, today's event, you'll receive a short survey from us. Please take two minutes to give us feedback on today's discussion, but also more importantly, to give us some ideas of what future topics might be of interest to you. And now it is my honor to introduce today's panel discussion on innovations in brewing and our discussion facilitator in our very own Asias Kalkeli. Asias is a research and development engineer for the Department of Chemical and Bio Biomolecular Engineering here at, at, here at Berkeley, where he oversees a variety of different projects. He is also a self-identified beer enthusiast and teaches a lab on brewing science for the College of Chemistry. Thank you, Asias, for agreeing to participate in today's panel discussion, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Law, and uh, thanks, uh, the panel. Uh, today we have three distinguished panels, and uh, first one is Rachel Lee, is a co-founder of Berkeley East and received her graduate degree at UC Berkeley while working in the College of uh, Chemistry with Professor Jay Kisling's laboratory. And second one is Raul Batra, is a senior manager of innovation at Anheuser-Busch and received his BS from Berkeley in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And the third uh, panelist is Colin Saratini. Uh, he is a senior scientist in product innovation at Impossible Foods and previously worked at Alaskan Brewing Company. He received his PhD from Berkeley in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering with Professor Radke. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming. Um, Colin, uh, I'll start with you. Uh, can you give us a summary of brewing process and what are the main ingredients in making, uh, for example, a beer? Yeah, sure. I'll keep it pretty quick here, but I just figured to give everybody an, an overview before we get into the nitty gritty of some of the technical details. Um, basically beer has four primary ingredients, water, which is the solvent for those chemists out there. <laughs> malt, which is the sugar source, um, hops, which lead to flavor, bitterness, um, and yeast, which convert the sugar to ethanol. So those are the four major ingredients. And the basic steps for making beer in the brewery are first to soak the malt in water to create a sugar water called wort. And the idea is to convert the, the starch using enzymes into simple fermentable sugars. Once you get that sugar water, then we separate the sugar water from the grain or the malt and you recover that sugar water and that's called the wort. And now the next step is to take that sugar water, the wort and boil it. And that is usually boiled for about an hour. And there is where you'll add the hops. And there's a lot of things that are happening during the boil, uh, but primarily you're, primarily you're um, solubilizing any of the, of the hop bitterness compounds. You're inactivating any microbes that might be there and any enzymes. 
you also have some flavor development um, and you're precipitating out proteins. Um, and then you'll take the wort and cool it down. And then that's where you introduce the yeast and that's where the yeast convert the sugar water into beer by converting the sugar into ethanol and CO2. And so people say that brewers make wort, but, but yeast makes beer in the end. <laughs> and there's a few steps at the end of the process to carbonate, um, potentially filter, but that's the big picture of what's happening. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of chemistry and chemical engineering that, that could be exploited at all of those steps. Hopefully that gives a good brief inter overview. Yeah, thanks, Colin. I think that was a nice summary of, you know, what's the process and what ingredients, you know, it takes to make a beer. And I'll, I'll uh, the next topic is going to be like, uh, Rachel, uh, to you. The brewing industry is a traditional one with many brewers using a technology that remain basically unchanged the last hundred years. But in recent years, the situation has been changed with the brewers looking to be more cost effective and to create the perfect flavor. Um, to you, what technological innovations are your company companies using to increase productivity, save energy, or create new products? I'll start with Rachel and just go with uh, Raul and Colin. Go ahead, yeah. Rachel. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about what my company is doing, and then I guess it'll turn into a discussion. Um, but very generally, we at Berkeley Yeast, we're using genetic engineering to make new and improved yeasts uh, with a focus on the beer industry. Um, basically, we work by talking to as many customers as possible and getting a sense of what are the issues that brewers face um, that they've probably always faced that we can solve by engineering yeast, uh, by making you know, new and improved yeasts. Um, you know, maybe there's a strain that a brewer loves. Um, they love most aspects of it, but there's something that they don't love about it. Can we uh, get rid of that trait? Or um, I know we'll be discussing sustainability later. Um, can we use yeast to make the brewing process more sustainable? These are things that we think a lot about and um, are aspects that we've engineered or are trying to engineer uh, into brewer's yeast. Um, so I don't wanna just you know, go into a big list, but, uh, and, and I'm happy to talk about this in more detail later if people are interested, but um, I sort of see what we do as like broken down into um, you know, five to 10 different benefits. Um, one of which of course is sustainability. Um, being able to reduce agricultural inputs by making up some of the flavor or benefit from the yeast. Um, and connected to that is, um, you know, getting more out of your hops. So we can use our yeast to enhance the hops that, that brewers use. Um, there, there's a bunch of others, you know, in, improving streamlining processes, um, getting rid of off flavors, making the process faster. This also helps with sustainability. Um, and again, I don't want to go into a big long list, so maybe I'll, I'll let someone take over, but uh, there are a lot of aspects that uh, in the brewing process that, that yeast can uh, do and that new yeasts can now do. And that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do at Berkeley Yeast. Thanks, Rachel and Colin. Sure, I can, I can definitely add to that. Um, I guess in my role at Alaskan Brewing, um, I think I was doing a lot of sort of process related improvements and, and thinking about how technology could, could really change the game from that standpoint. Um, so I'll give a couple examples of what I know that we were doing in the in the craft brewing industry and, and probably in other places too. And I'm sure Rahul could speak to like some of the stuff that AB InBev is doing. Um, but like I know at Alaskan Brewing, a few things that, that we did that were, and it's hard to pick apart like in this area, technology improvements from like sustainability really, because a lot of any of the process improvements pretty much helped uh, improve 
either like water usage or material usage or energy usage, which at the end of the day, like comes back to sustainability in a way. But uh, a big example is <clears throat> there is a piece of equipment called a mash filter press, which in the second step of the brewing process that I described where you're trying to separate all the sugar water from this big like bed of grain, essentially you like have soaked your, your grain in warm water and you have sugar water all in this like packed bed and you're trying to separate out the sugar water, the part that you want to keep from the grain, which is going to get thrown out. And if you think about it, there's a, the good analogy that we use for the mash filter press is a mash filter press is like a French press for coffee. Whereas like the water ton, which is how you typically separate the, the grain and the water is like a drip coffee machine. So at the, in a drip coffee machine or in the water ton, you're basically dripping water through the bed of grain to rinse the sugar water out. In the mash filter press, you actually squeeze the bed of grain and it's essentially a plate and frame system where you put a whole bunch of the, of the uh, grain and water together and then squeeze it out. And so you get a much more efficient recovery of your, of your sugar and your sugar water. And so you can use less water, you can use less malt to produce the same amount of beer. Um, and so that's something Alaskan Brewing was one of the first, I think maybe the first, brewery in the U.S. craft brewery to adopt that technology, but a lot more breweries are doing that now. It's actually an old technology. I think the Belgians have been using it at least since like 1900. So it's like new to <laughs> some companies, maybe old to others. Um, but I think there's other things that I'll just go through in a more like high level. Um, there's also like carbon capture. So I mentioned that like when yeast ferment, they eat up the sugar, but about 50% of the sugar by mass goes to CO2. And that can just either bubble out of the fermenters and be wasted, or you can actually recover it, clean it, compress it, and then use it later in the process to carbonate the beer. That was something Alaskan Brewing was doing out of necessity because the brewery is in Alaska and it's remote, not on the road system. <laughs> and so it actually was not feasible for them to get uh, like shipments of CO2 like most breweries normally do. Um, so we had to save our own CO2 and use it. Um, another thing uh, uh, that I think was an interesting innovation that I think will be interesting to see how this progresses, but technologies for reusing the grain. So I mentioned that like you take malt and we soak it in the water, we extract the sugar that we want, but then we're left with this sort of like high lignin, high protein material that is not necessarily high value. Um, I think a lot of people are successfully able to uh, give that to farmers for, for cow or for cattle feed, but other places aren't able to do that. Um, and so for instance, at Alaskan Brewing, they there wasn't that option. There weren't any farms that could take it where we were. And so they actually invented a process to take that grain, dry it out and burn it in a biomass boiler so that you now have like a green source of energy to provide steam for the brew house um, and also then dry the grain. So it was kind of a, they called it beer powered beer, <laughs> which is an interesting marketing term for that. But it's, it's really like heat, you know, basically like recovering all of your energy. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there and, and, and make sure that Rahul can add to that. Yeah, no, Colin, I think you made some really excellent points. And I think uh, one of the things that you highlighted is, is, you know, really important for us as, as big brewers, AB included, uh, to realize, which is that often um, sustainable moves can be more cost effective too. Um, and so you sort of have the business impact um, and also the environmental impact, which uh, you don't often get. But we find that with a lot of uh, our sustainable innovations, they also save us money in, in terms of heat usage or water usage, or like Colin was mentioning, spent grain, just to use that as an example. Um, you know, the past several decades, several hundred of years, um, we've been using, you know, spent grain as cattle feed, right? 
um, and we sell it off, it's, it's sold off for, you know, cents essentially. And, and it really was just sort of a waste product for us uh, until a few years ago, we actually have an internal incubator called ZX Ventures um, at our company. And uh, these two entrepreneurs basically came up with uh, a product, uh, a byproduct uh, to use that spent grain as barley milk and created, created this product called uh, originally Canvas. It's now uh, launched its, its own company. It's a spinoff from, from AB called Take Two Foods uh, in Portland. But, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the, the increase of, you know, alternative milks. You see oat milk, almond milk, um, and even companies like Oatly. Uh, that are really now taking off. And so they sort of spun off that innovation to use that spent grain and create a new product and a new category altogether. Um, so you see a lot of those sorts of in innovations, which are more product forward. Um, and then just to give two other examples of technological innovations, a lot of the stuff I get to work on being on the innovation team is, you know, liquid and pack innovation. So one of the first projects um, I got to work on when I joined the innovation team uh, was actually a Budweiser extension called Budweiser Harvest Reserve. Um, and it was the first time we actually were able to use a real wood label, right? Which is very difficult to do and to do it in a production environment. Um, and that was, you know, in, done in partnership with our family of barley farmers, uh, where we basically were able to trace the supply chain all the way back to the family that brewed the barley that went into that bottle. And so consumers could experience that and they could understand where their barley was coming from. Um, another one actually is more recent is Michelob Ultra um, is now trying to pioneer the, the lowest carbon aluminum can. Um, so if you look at our supply chain, packaging is actually 70% of our carbon emissions come from packaging. The brewing process is actually way more sustainable than the packaging process. Um, and a lot of those carbon emissions come from aluminum. Um, so we actually recently partnered with Rio Tinto, which is one of the world's largest aluminum producers. Um, and another startup in Canada to look at how we can basically lower the, the carbon impact of aluminum smelting. Um, and so basically Michelob Ultra has been working with them to produce a pilot of a million cans this year um, with this new process to basically lower the, the carbon footprint of that part of the supply chain. Thanks, Raul. Um, now we'll bring it back to the, the major uh, uh, part of our discussion, which is sustainability. Uh, over the last decade, consumers have been looking uh, for responsible products and manufacturers know it. How do you see the world's growing concern over issues as environment, environmental impact, sustainability, health and safety impacting the brewing industry? Uh, Rachel, why don't you have a crack at it? Sure, yeah, I'm, I think, Colin and Rahul already touched on a lot of the issues in sustainability and brewing, um, but there are a lot of parts of the brewing process that are not particularly sustainable. Um, you know, a lot of water goes into both the, the raw ingredients and the brewing process itself. Um, a lot of energy is needed to produce heat for the brewing process and then later once the brew is done to cool um, and to keep your beer cold. Uh, there's transportation issues, um, transporting both raw ingredients and the final product. And then as Colin mentioned, there's things um, like a lot of CO2 is made during brewing. Um, can we capture that or is it just lost to the environment? Um, you know, what do we do about the wastewater that comes out of the brewing process? Uh, so a lot of a lot of breweries have um, you know started to um, approach brewing in a more sustainable way, um, partly because it's become a much bigger issue recently. Uh, and and actually, I think a lot of consumers there's there's been studies shown that a lot of consumers are very concerned about this, and quite a lot of beer consumers would be happy to actually pay more for a beer that is clearly more sustainable than a beer that is not. So. Um, so there's a lot of aspects to uh, sustainability in brewing. Um, I guess I'd like to maybe just tell you a little bit about how the yeast that we're making can, can uh, make brewing more sustainable. Um, and one way is by um, you know, reducing your inputs uh, in combination with some of our flavor producing strains. Um, and kind of getting more out of your hops. So 
for example, um, as, as Colin mentioned at the beginning when he described the brewing process, hops are really important as a flavor component in beer. Um, and depending on when you add them in the brewing process, they can impart uh, kind of floral and citrus and all these other types of flavors and aromas. Um, and there are um, a lot of compounds in the hops that are kind of bound up to other molecules that make them uh, not flavorful or not aromatic. And during fermentation, yeast can basically um, uh, cleave those molecules and release the flavor component but strains are more or less efficient in their ability to do so. Um, and so you might be using a strain that's not very efficient and to get the same amount of flavor out of your hops, you're gonna have to use more hops uh, than you would if you had a yeast strain that was much more efficient at releasing those flavors. So um, we've developed some strains that uh, are ultimate biotransformers uh, biotransformation is the word, the word that brewers use referring to this ability of yeast to, uh, you know, transform these non-aromatic compounds in hops into aromatic compounds. And so we've been working on basically improving the efficiency of yeast um, to be able to do that. So you can, you know, you could use the same amount of hops and just get more flavor. You could reduce the hops and get the same amount of flavor. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. Um, this is also being used in combination or with uh, the USDA has a hop breeding program and they've been focusing a lot recently on um, breeding drought resistant hops um, and which, you know, for climate change is becoming a big issue. Hops require a lot of water to grow, um, but these drought resistant hops tend not to be very flavorful. And so our idea is that you could still use those to add the bitterness um, and other flavors, but the yeast that we're making can then impart these uh, aromatics that you really want in a lot of the popular beers today. Um, so this is just one example of a way that, you know, you can reduce the agricultural inputs and the water, making the brewing process more sustainable um, by using a new yeast. Thanks, Rachel. And how about Raul? Well, problem. I mean, I think just to, to sort of respond to what Rachel's saying, it's freaking awesome science for anyone who hasn't checked out Berkeley yeast. Um, I've personally had my eyes on what they've been doing for like the last four years. Um, and and uh, Charles Denby and, and Rachel, um, both as co-founders have done, I think, a tremendous job in, in finding both a, uh, you know, solving a consumer problem, right, which is the, the constant desire for new flavors, new aromas, new tastes, right? If you think about beer, if you're not solving for that consumer need, you probably won't end up having a very viable business, right? But what they've also done is they've found a way to also have uh, an amazing environmental impact at the same time, right? And Rachel hit on it, but you know, hops are the most water intensive component of the brewing process. Um, so if you can reduce that impact uh, in the supply chain, I, I think it's an amazing opportunity. I think, I don't know if this is an apt analogy, Rachel, but I think of Berkeley yeast as the equivalent to what Impossible Foods is doing in the, the meat space, you guys are doing in the space of beer. Um, yeah, and are. I really think <laughs> there's a lot of potential there. So really, yeah, really I'll cool to see. Yeah, just add that they were a huge influence and inspiration for us actually. So yes, definitely. Um, so it's, I, I think it's just cool to see. And as someone who works at you know, a big beer company, we're always excited about this type of innovation because it's folks like Rachel who are pioneering it at a very early stage, at a seed stage. And once that can reach the critical mass and the scale, um, you know, a company like us would, of course, uh, love to be a part of that um, as a customer of that, of that science and technology. Thanks, Raul. And let's, let's move down to uh, new <laughs> four point. Yeah. Besides, can right. I can I just add to that before sure. we move Absolutely. to the next one? Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Um, I mean, I could add to the to the list of people here with a crush on Berkeley yeast too, because I do think that the coolest thing going on in that area is is in the yeast. Um, but I I did just want to point out that like thinking about sustainability, one of the biggest things as a starting point is like measuring your impact and understanding if you're a brewery right? Measuring your impact 
and understanding KPIs or like key performance indicators that are going to that are going to allow you to benchmark how you're doing against other companies and like focus your efforts on and on focus your efforts for improving sustainability. And I think that like something I just want to point out is that like the Brewers Association, which is a large uh, trade organization for craft brewers started uh, like, I don't exactly know how long ago, but on the order of like five to 10 years ago, collecting information across all the members who are participating. And so a lot of craft breweries are basically self-reporting their water usage, electricity usage, energy usage, uh, landfill diversion rates, uh, recycling rates, like all of that information, putting it, giving it to the Brewers Association, which is then anonymizing the data um, and then distributing it back to breweries within the cohorts of different sizes. So whether, depending on your production size, so you can see how do you perform relative to others in your peer group. And, and they'll call out and highlight companies that are like best in class to then educate each other on like best practices for reducing water usage. Like, oh, hey, we installed this piece of equipment or made this decision with cleaning to change our, you know, our impact. And I think that's definitely a promising thing to see that like all the breweries are coming together and learning from each other and, and kind of like tracking and improving where possible. Thanks, Colin. Uh, that was insight. Um, uh, let, let's go down to the new forefront of innovation. I think, you know, was uh, uh, the recent uh, explosion of hard seltzer. In 2019, hard seltzer exploded into a billion dollar business, okay? And it's difficult to ignore the impact upon the brewing industry. And this is for Raul. Uh, do you see the rising consumer interest in clear uh, flavor alcohol as a substantial trade to beer industry or as a vehicle to the future of industry? As what a is, substantial threat or a vehicle to growth. It's 100% yeah. a vehicle to growth. Okay. Um, I think if you asked, uh, you know, the major brewers of today, maybe five to 10 years ago, they might have initially thought, okay, this might be, you know, a short term trend. But I think today it's, uh, uh, almost a, a, a certainty that hard seltzer is here to stay. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I could probably, we could do a whole separate session just on the rise of hard seltzer, the consumer trends that are driving it, um, where it's going to go in five to 10 to 15 years. Um, but I think just a few thoughts uh, to start. So if you go back um, almost a decade, so in uh, mid to late uh, 2011, there was a brewer named Nick Shields out of uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, who uh, basically grew up in a family of brewers. His grandfather was a brewer, his father was a brewer, and he of course went into that industry. Um, and his family had you know, a very, very small craft brewery in, in, in the Northeast. Um, and he started experimenting with um, basically champagne yeast uh, to use that to create uh, a really light, uh, low in calorie uh, beverage that eventually became hard seltzer. Um, and, and that those ex early experiments ended up um, actually inspiring him to found his own company called Spiked Seltzer. Um, and a lot of you might be familiar with that brand, which eventually became Spiked Seltzer. It was acquired by Anheuser-Busch in 2013, I believe. Um, and that, that was actually the first uh, formalized seltzer company, hard seltzer company in the United States. Um, but of course, it, it's not today the biggest, right? Um, An Anheuser-Busch actually as a company was, was really in many ways the first of the major brewers to enter the space. Um, but for you know, a few years, at least from 2012 until 2016, that category hadn't really uh, picked up the speed it eventually picked up. It hadn't gained that consumer traction. Um, and it wasn't really until 2016 when Mark Anthony Brands came out with White Claw uh, which became basically a viral sensation. Um, and a Boston beer, uh, the maker of Sam Adams came out with truly hard seltzer. 
um, that that became sort of the summer of seltzer. Um, and since then, like no brewer has looked back. I think uh, many people are now saying that seltzer is the new light beer. It's the equivalent to the light beer wars of, you know, the late 1980s and the early 90s when it was Bud Light versus Miller Light versus Coors Light. And everyone was, just, you know, about how can we make our beer lighter and lower in calories? Now it's all about how can we expand our seltzer growth? Um, and so I think where it gets interesting, though, is like the seltzer story isn't over. Because um, if you think about it from a consumer perspective, it's like, okay, great. We took the seltzer flavors that people are familiar with. You think of LaCroix. LaCroix was super popular for, you know, a few years and they just made it, you know, alcoholic, right? Okay, great. But now you're starting to see more seltzers doing a lot more creative things, whether it's, you know, adding more flavor in there. Uh, we just launched a new seltzer called Cacti, which I got to work on in partnership with Travis Scott, a big hip hop artist. Um, which uses, you know, premium blue agave from Mexico, right? And so that is adding an, an extra element for a consumer who's looking for something more, right? Because seltzer also has its faults. Some people see it as too bland, lacking in flavor. And going back to what Rachel was saying earlier, you always have to, I mean, we tend to, at least at our company, innovate consumer first, right? What are people looking for? And when you can deliver against that and come up with a product that delivers against those needs, then you have something that could really stand the chance of, of winning in, you know, the very competitive environment um, that the beer and seltzer industry is in. So I'll, I'll pause there for a second, but um, Colin or Rachel, you have any thoughts on seltzer? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't have too much to add, but just from, from a yeast point of view, which is really my point of view, I guess, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of, um, like flavor is, is a really important part of hard seltzer because, you know, there are not too many components, right? It's uh, sugar water, yeast to make alcohol and then some flavor in the end. So uh, from our point of view, um, using yeasts that make flavors is kind of an interesting proposition uh, for the hard seltzer world. And uh, a lot of breweries are, you know, getting on the hard seltzer train and making hard seltzers now. So uh, there's a lot of, of interest there as well. Um, for our business. Yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in from maybe a little bit different of a perspective uh, from Rahul's, which would be like the sort of coming from the, what's happening in the craft section or sector. Uh, I think, I mean, it, it looks like a lot of different craft breweries are coming out with, with hard seltzers. Um, and I think part of that is just like, there's so many different interesting ideas like Rahul was pointing out like that you can add like whether it's the cactus <laughs> um I know Alaskan Brewing also like added their own while I was there uh worked with some really awesome people there to develop a, a hard seltzer that had spruce tip infusion right because that was kind of our local interesting ingredient and gave it a whole different kind of feel and it just like Rachel's pointing out you could add a lot of interesting flavors with yeast or in, in any other way. But I think like from a big picture standpoint, um, craft brewing and craft beer has really, really taken off. And I think if you look over the last like couple decades, the number of craft breweries has been growing like exponentially. Um, and for a while, so did the share of the overall or like the overall like production also grew a lot in the craft sector. And then for the last few years, um, there's more breweries, but not that much more craft beer being sold. Uh, so I think everybody's kind of fighting for uh, the same pie. So you have, everybody's kind of getting a smaller slice. And I think just something to point out there is like seltzer space is something where all of a sudden you're seeing like hundreds of percent growth <laughs> year over year. And so I think from that standpoint, it's also, you know, just from a business standpoint, something that you kind of have to get into almost. Thanks, I, it, yeah. A hundred percent. It's the new frontier. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is in many ways. With that, uh, how about the focus on automation and the big data? How do you see this? This is for Colin, okay? How do you see automation, robotics, and laboratory analysis being applied to advance the brewing industry nowadays? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think so. I'll speak 
from my experience, um, and I'm sure a lot of other craft breweries are similar to this. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to collect data. And, and I'll, I'll just preface this by saying that like, I'm thinking about it from a very much a process standpoint and like beer making. I'm sure I will, you might want to add from like a bigger picture, like marketing or, 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 or wherever you want. Um, but like, I'm really just thinking about, there's a lot of opportunities for collecting data about the process and, and how your yeast, like basically process data, like temperatures, times, um, specific gravity, like basically how your, how your process runs from beginning to end. I think there's a huge amount of data that we collect in like SCADA systems or even just in like pieces of paper with like brew logs. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity and a lot of breweries are recognizing this to start automating that data collection structuring those data in databases that are then searchable and actionable and you can connect the process data to the actual like sensory or 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 specs that you care about like abv or gravity or color or uh, ibus and there's this opportunity to collect like your outputs and your inputs and understand which of your processing variables impact things that you care about at the, at the other end. So, I mean, I think that's to me like a huge opportunity and something that like maybe not all craft breweries had been doing previously, but something that's now like tangible and within their ability with the availability of like automated data collection systems and like databasing, like whether it's uh, your SCADA systems or your ERP systems. And like, I'm going to kind of toss it over to Rahul now because we interacted when I was at Alaskan Brewing with a, people who are either current or like former professionals, like from AB and, you know, they were telling us and, and explaining to us their systems and just the amount of data that a company that like is working at that level collects and is able to use to make decisions is so powerful in being able to like know and predict when a batch is going to be done or when it's going to be out of spec. Um, so yeah, I want to like, pass it over to Rahul at this point. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, too many thoughts, but I'll try to figure out where I want to start. Um, I think to start simply, I would say data affects every single industry and beer for sure. Um, and actually, I think in many ways, even more so than one might think, uh, the reason being you have a very physical product, right? Which is beer itself the packaging that encapsulates that beer, right? The logistics to get that beer to a retailer and eventually to a consumer. And then on the flip side, you have the consumer driven data, right? Which is also new in, to, to many companies, right? Whether that's Nike or McDonald's or Anheuser-Busch or Coca-Cola or PepsiCo, they're collecting data about their consumers, right? And more and more uh, companies have more data about their consumers, often anonymized, but they still have it in aggregate to describe, hey, this is what people in California, uh, these are the trends we're seeing among, you know, young uh, consumers in Northern California. How can we innovate to create products for them? Or these are the trends we're seeing in Atlanta, where, you know, sweet flavored malt beverages tend to do very, very well. And, and so what you sort of have is now, how can you match this consumer data set to the production uh, data set, right? And so like extrapolating off what Colin was saying, you know, we at Anheuser-Busch, I mean, we've collected data on our production side for decades, right? Um, and, you know, if you go back 20 years, we were doing it in, in pretty old school ways, but we still had it. But I think now the challenge is how can we iterate on that data and do it in a quicker way? If you think about how software companies are driven right in this whole move towards agile software development. It's about gathering consumer data and then pushing out a product very quickly, right? That's how Google, you know, is able to, uh, or, or Facebook, for example, or Instagram to um, modify and improve their product over time, but they're doing it in very, very small increments. And you don't even notice the changes as a user. Um, with beer, it's really hard, right? You push out a product and you're doing it at scale. And Anheuser-Busch, you know, if you go back prior to three or four years ago, 
when we launched an innovation, it would usually only be at scale. That's all we knew how to do. We're a huge company, right? And so the now, now the challenge for us is we're actually pull, pushing ourselves to be uh, smaller in our innovations and to pilot things. And the team I actually work on is, is our piloting arm of the innovation team. So we'll go test something in two cities and we'll learn in the span of four months, what are consumers telling us? What's all the data we can gather? And then take it back to a production team to say, look, we need to optimize the packaging in this way. We need to um, you know, amplify the flavor that we're getting out of the agave in this way. And then we'll launch it, you know, regionally next, right? And then we'll learn again before we go national and invest, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars behind a launch. And that helps us create products that can stand the test of time, right? Because we've, we'll admit it, but we've had many products we've launched at a national scale that have failed after two or three years. You know, look at hard root beer. We launched when Not Your Father's Root Beer came out, we launched Best Damn Root Beer. It did okay for the first year, then the trend fell off and we had spent, you know, tens of millions of dollars in the marketing behind this product. Um, and it's just not the right way to innovate. So I think more and more companies are figuring out how to use data to their advantage, how to actually be more agile and smaller in scale, which for us as a big company is now actually the push. Um, and I think it's it's helping us a lot in that regard. Thank you, Raul. Uh, can, I, uh, can I just add? Sure, just, uh, yeah, a quick one. I think we yeah, have a lot of yeah. time, so yeah, just go so ahead. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't have much to add, but I will sure. just say that um, this, you know, the agile development process that Raul was just talking about, is also a big influence on um, metabolic engineering right now. And the process of, you know, design, build, test, learn is a big, um, is, is kind of how metabolic engineering works now. And that that is the process that we use to develop new yeast, you know, design, build, test, go out to talk to customers, see what they think, make beer, learn from that and improve. So it is, it is a huge part of what we do as well. Thank you now, I think, uh... Or to save time, I think we'll go to question and answers, and I'm going to be reading it to you guys, and, you know, you just go crack at it, okay? So uh, the first question will be, uh, uh, would it be ideal brewing organism be a bacterium genet uh, genetically engineered with optimized ethanol metabolism instead of yeast? More rapid growth and metabolism in bacteria potentially yield more rapid brewing process. This is probably for Rachel. Would you try this? <laughs> uh, hmm, let's see. Well, uh, although there are a lot of innovations in brewing, there's uh, a lot of tradition as well. And so I feel like getting brewers to switch from yeast, which has been used for thousands of years, to bacteria is a much harder sell. Um, also, engineering bacteria to, to make ethanol to begin with might be harder depending on, you know, what you choose. Yeast already does that. It converts sugar into ethanol and already makes flavors. So there's, you know, a lot of precedent there to start with. Um, there are a lot of possibilities, though, I'm sure uh, that, so I can't say 100% that it won't ever happen, but just keeping with yeast for now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Colin looks I, like he wants to add something. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I'm glad, glad that Brian Myrell is here because he's got a ton. Of, <laughs> he, he always comes up with great questions <laughs> like this. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I think echoing what what Rachel said, you know, I, for a lot of the classic beer styles, a significant portion of the flavor actually comes from secondary metabolites and, and other compounds that are produced by the yeast. So like, could you get a Saison or a wit beer or something like that with bacteria? Maybe, I mean, it's all possible, uh, but yeah, I think there'd be some reticence uh, from, the, from the brewing community, but I, 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 bet, I bet it'll happen. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, and it's done with sour beers, right? So, yeah. you know, I think yeah. that might be a first uh, sort of case study to see potentially, right? Because that's how sour beers are created naturally is through the uh, importation of bacteria coming from the air. Yeah, although I think a lot of brewers prefer to make kettle sours with just yeast these days. And now, you know, there's a couple of different engineered yeasts that actually make sour flavors as well. So make lactic acid, uh, we have we have one, but um, another yeast company has has one as well, and so it seems like they're making it easier, not not more more difficult. Yeah, 
No, and it's a good point. I mean, to Rachel's original point, I mean, yeast is the most secret and protected thing any brewer owns, right? It is our most important IP. Um, at Anheuser-Busch, we have, I think on the order of like five to six vaults throughout the world where the Budweiser yeast strain is, is secured, right? So it's the same thing for Coca-Cola, right? Their, their secret formula for what goes into that syrup is protected in Atlanta, Georgia. For us, it's the yeast strain. Um, and that is really the magic behind beer. Um, so I think to echo her sentiment, yeast is, is probably here to stay. Um, thanks. Um, I have another question. This will focus also to Rachel. How long does it take for a new year strain from R&D to a pilot program to off the shelf product? Uh, it kind of depends on what trait we're, we're engineering. Um, so like for the sour yeast, for example, if, if we're just trying to make lactic acid, um, we know the genes involved in making lactic acid. We know it's only one step that we have to add to yeast. Uh, it's not very difficult to optimize. So if a brewer says, I want you to make um, lactic acid production in this other strain, uh, it's really quick for us to do that. You know, it's a matter of a month or two for us to, to build the strain and hand it off to them uh, for trials. If on the other hand, someone wants a more complex flavor, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of plant or hop, like hop flavors are combination of hundreds of compounds, then recapitulating that flavor can be a lot more work and a lot more research as well. So we might have to, you know, look into what it is that imparts this flavor and how can we make it and how can we get used to make it? So that process can be a lot longer. Um, I mean, you know, a year or more, several years, uh, kind of just depends uh, on what we're working on. Uh, with that also, I'll, I have another, uh, goes to that, uh, to Rachel. Will Berkeley use to start packaging products for the home brewing market? Uh, we get this question a lot and uh, the answer is yes, eventually. I don't know the timing on that. We would love to sell the home brewers. It's, uh, it's just something we haven't had the capacity to, to do yet. You know, our manufacturing is, is for larger scale things right now and we've had to get that up and running, but yes, we will. Okay. Um, I think this question on GMO is really interesting. And all three of us, I'm sure will have a very unique take on, on that. The one that Sasha asked. So I asked if you want to just repeat it for the audience. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, strain engineering in Berkeley yeast is done in a GMO way. I'm sure you have had this question many times, but are beer companies really interested in using GMO yeast? Would any in beverage use GMO yeast? This is like for Rachel and Raul probably. And Colin too, because of too, yeah. Foods, so. yeah. It's, it's all three of us. Yeah, uh, do you want me to? I, I could yeah. start from a, just from a non-technical point of view. So I think it's a really great question, Sasha. Great question you asked. Um, so I think a huge hurdle, and I've spoken with Rachel and, and her co-founder, Charles, about this, but I think a big hurdle um, that, you know, won't just exist in the U.S., but worldwide is overcoming the sort of fear of GMO right? Um, but GMO is not bad. It's not inherently bad. Uh, and I think, especially when you think about it from, you know, what Berkeley yeast is doing, and I'll let Rachel answer um, to, to their standpoint, but at least the way I see it is what they're doing is environmentally better. It's better for the consumer because you're offering new flavors that don't exist in the natural world through hops that are cultivated on farms and, you know, use up a bunch of water. Um, and so I think, if you can create a product and, and eventually really the marketing to support it, that will educate consumers on the benefits of genetically modified organisms, the same way impossible foods, right? They're using yeast to artificially create heme. That is GMO, right? And Colin, you can attest or, or you can speak to that better than I can. But I think more people are starting to uh, see these products in market 
but really the marketing behind it is also doing a bit of that education, right? I think the great thing though, that Impossible Foods has done and why I think honestly, they're gonna win in this category, at least out of the competitors that I see so far, is that they're creating a product that isn't just for people who are, you know, are vegans or vegetarians. It's for meat eaters, for people who like meat, here is now an alternative. Oh, and by the way, it's created with this really cool science. But if you just look at it product first, it's a really great product. And I think it's the same thing with Berkeley yeast, you know, their ability to get into the big players like AB will be, man, if, if you can come with these new flavors, these new aromas, these new tastes that don't exist today, consumers are always going to be excited by that. Oh, and by the way, you're saving 70% of the water that goes into the supply chain through the elimination of, of hops as a part of the process. Awesome. Right. So I think with that lens, like you'll start to see more innovation in this space. And I think GMO is, I mean, I'm for it. I give my personal uh, thumbs up. I think it's, it's going to be the future for how we save the planet in simple terms. Yeah. So to be, I mean, just to say it, like, yes, um, our yeasts are GMO, um, but we're very careful about, you know, how we approach it and how we use it and uh, how we talk to customers about it. So uh, to begin with, you know, we always, we're only using genes that come from organisms that are already safe themselves. You know, we get a lot of genes from edible plants, for example, um, including like hop, you know, genes from hops. Like we want to make hop flavors. The hops have the genes to make those. We can transport that and put that, you know, put that into yeast. Uh, so we're careful about the source of the DNA, um, just so that there's, you know, no question there. Uh, and, and we're, you know, engineering traits that are already out there in the food and beverage industry and that are shown to be safe. Um, but of course we do a lot of testing as well once we make our strains. So we're really careful to um, be clear that what we're doing is as safe as possible. Uh, I, I also think it's, as Rahul said, it's like an important um, education. Uh, you know, education is a really important part of it and being transparent about why you're doing it and what the benefits are and how they might outweigh the, the negatives, um, you know, sustainability, things like that. So uh, really starting a conversation about like why we are using GMOs and what they can offer to, to the world. It's, it's very important. Uh, maybe Colin has, Colin has more to add. Uh, from now the to Colin for his opinion on burgers. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's interesting that, that yeah, the impossible foods angle kind of comes into this, but I, I think what you guys expressed, I, I, I couldn't agree with more what, what you guys are both saying. I think it really just comes down to like us as scientists being really thorough and transparent and, and doing, I guess, doing solid science and making sure to keep safety top of mind. And then also to do a good job as science communicators and educators to just make sure that people understand the risks and the places where there aren't really risks <laughs> as well, right? Like understanding that like we're just, for instance, creating a protein that already exists in nature, just harnessing, you know, the yeast that we normally use to make beer to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think hopefully it's something that we'll see an ability to sort of like shift the public perception on that just through having good products, uh, transparent science and, and like communicating with like evidence-based research as to like what the risks are. An interesting question. Uh, this will be like maybe for Colin or any, any one of you can crack at it. It seems like uh, craft brewing needs to increase emphasis on lot size and consistency. Uh, for scale, how to achieve this without losing local customer connection? How, how do you do that? I mean, you know, we, we know that you know, big, big uh, beer companies are gobbling the local ones. So how, maybe Raul, maybe I'll ask you to you know, speak to that. The size, could you, so the question was like, it seems like craft beer needs to increase their repeatability, their consistency, consistency. and their scale to yes. compete. Yeah. That, that's the question. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. 
Okay, uh, this is just my opinion as Colin. I don't, I'm not like going to speak for a Alaskan Brewing. Obviously, I don't work there anymore. Um, yeah. Look, I, I think <laughs> I think that the ABs of the world are never going to compete with like local craft beer. I mean, because at the end of the day, what people want is something that's like unique and different and crazy and like made by their local community. And those are the people that are going to buy craft beer. Um, and I just think that like your small local breweries are going to be more nimble and more flexible and more able to like try weird, wacky things. And a lot of those things are going to fail and be gross. Uh, and <laughs> some of those things are going to be great, um, but it's going to bring the local flavor in. I, but I don't think that craft breweries should or like can really compete with the ABs of the world as far as like creating certain products that you are going to go in that I can go into the grocery store and buy a Bud Light in any place in the world and have it be like get be the same and be consistent and like give me that same like refreshing taste that I want right like they're just I think it's a different game plan I don't think that craft beer is ever going to like out compete big beer at like a large scale consistent production. I mean, there's some things we can do to like improve our consistency. And I think so that customers will be repeat customers, but I think they're kind of like different worlds. Interested in what Rahul thinks about that. No, I would agree 100%. And I think each entity knows what they're good at. And I think um, to be honest, the best thing that ever happened to the beer industry was the introduction of craft. You know, if anything, what it has done for big beer is it's pushed the needle of innovation forward and it's accelerated um, the pace of innovation, right? And most of the, the new trends that you see are driven by craft brewers first, right? They're the ones who are experimenting, who are, you know, they're like, they're entrepreneurs in their own right. And um, the, the fear of failure is, is, you know, less so, right? In, in a company that may be smaller and, and maybe more nimble in their approach. Um, and, and we at AB, we respect that hugely, right? And I think um, for us, it's, it's done a lot. I mean, even on our own innovation team, we look to craft breweries around the United States and around the world to see what they're doing because they're leading and they're pioneering in many ways, a lot of the things that won't hit critical mass for another five or 10 years. Um, but I think both, we kind of need each other. Um, and for a small craft brewery uh, to eventually get massive distribution, sometimes that takes a partnership with a big brewer. Um, and I think, you know, the last thing I would say is I hope that at some point, and I think this, this is starting to change that we also celebrate that to a certain extent. You know, I think in the early days of craft in like the 2000s and the 2010s, when a craft brewery either got acquired in part or in whole, it was like, oh, villainize them. The founder sold out. But really at the end of the day, look, the founders, you know, doing very well financially and their teams for the most part, and most of these acquisitions are still fully employed. Um, and then you, for the consumer, you're allowing to get that beer on the national stage. Think of Goose Island, right? Is now available in more states than just Illinois or just Chicago. Um, so I'll leave it at, I think both need each other and it's sort of like a symbiotic relationship in that regard. Thank you, Raul. And I think with this, we conclude our question and answer and I'll pass it to Lo. Well. I want to jump in and just thank you all uh, for those that joined us today in today's panel discussion and, and to our four panelists uh, for sharing their experience and insights during this important discussion. I mean, thank you, Asias, Rachel, Raul, and, and Colin. Um, if I took anything away from today, it's that yeast is cool and science helps save the world and make better beer. And those are all important uh, learnings from today's talk. We hope you'll join us for future Berkeley ecosystem systems events, uh, check us out at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. As a quick reminder, please complete the survey that you will receive following this event. And of course, uh, as we say in Berkeley, go Bears.